never think it. Welcome to Global Kinship, month three of our new exploration of what is happening to bring us together to create a world, a more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. We swarm, and according to Sabrina Imbler, we swar swarm because we are full of the joy of being together, full of anger at the systems that exclude or endanger us, or full of hope for the possibilities of the future. And today we welcome two people that are dedicating their lives to such a future. And we're thrilled to have them both. But first I'll turn to Bob who will give us our technical uh, cues. Ah, thank you, Penny. Um, it's very brief. Um, there we go. Um, simply, uh, as with all the, of these kinds of webinars, we ask that you keep yourself muted until and unless you're going to be uh, asking a question in the Q&A. Um, and when we get to that stage, if you would, um, uh, if you have a question uh, for Brian, if you would simply refer to the reactions button on your Zoom toolbar. Under there, you'll see a little uh, a button that says raise hand. That will put you up to the front of the queue and we'll know to call on you in sequence. Um, thanks very much. And um, I think now I turn it over to Jennifer. Is that right? Uh, no, I'm going to introduce Jennifer and Jennifer ah, introduce no. us. <laughs> All right. uh, so Jennifer Morgan is a friend and president and founder of the Deep Time Network which offers courses on all manner of things related to the cosmos and a nine month deep time leadership and well-being program. She's an award-winning author, storyteller, and educator inspired by the works of Teilhard, Maria Montessori, Thomas Berry, and Brian Swim. Her universe story trilogy, and if you don't have it, it's highly recommended has been endorsed by Jane Goodall, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Thomas Berry, and others. Jennifer's life inspiration is to foster emergence by helping to link a planetary nervous system of people immersed in this radical new understanding. And I'll say just a word about Brian, because I have never done this before, just to say he's a beloved teacher of mine and many on this call, I am sure. But he is a poet of science, a troubadour who brings the music to us when we most need it to reclaim our wholeness and steer towards a heart-mind collective wholeness in these times when it is needed. Thank you. Jennifer? Thank you, Penny. Penny, that was a beautiful introduction for Brian. Um, I'll just give a few more details about Brian. Uh, he's professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, where he taught evolutionary cosmology to graduate students in the philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program. He is the co-creator with Mary Evelyn Tucker of the Emmy award-winning PBS documentary, Journey of the Universe and co-author of the companion book of the same title. He works with Monica Durast Bowles and Devin O'Dea of the Human Energy Project to produce the popular YouTube series, The Story of the Noosphere. His other published works include The Universe is a Green Dragon, The Universe Story, written with Thomas Berry, and The Hidden Heart of the Cosmos. Welcome, Brian. I know you're there somewhere. <laughs> I can't see you, but I know you're there. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, yeah. there you are. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. So why don't we start with, um, there are two key words, you know, that are at the heart of this event. And thank you so much, Penny and Gail and Bob for organizing this. Um, it's so important for people to come together to look at and really 
sort of ponder these ideas, which are so crucial. So the two words that are at the heart of this event are cosmogenesis and noosphere. So Brian, can you tell us about each of these words and how they relate to each other? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. I, I would love to, and I just I want to begin by 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 thanking Penny and Gail and the others for organizing this, and I send my best greetings out to all of you that are that are here. Uh, some of you are former students of mine. Um, I I don't think you have much more to learn from me, but it's so good to see your faces be part of this discussion so and uh so jennifer's idea of starting out with cosmogenesis and noosphere uh really you know, everything that i have to say is, is 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 captured by those two words so it's a great way to start off so that um especially if you have to leave you know you'll have the whole thing and and like and like penny said um it's about wholeness so uh, this this question of, of wholeness is uh, really the crucial the crucial thing of our time. I, some of you that have studied philosophy have looked at the 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 work of Immanuel Kant, who many regard as, as the greatest European philosopher during the scientific era, and Immanuel Kant. Um, you know, I, I have arguments with him, um, but he, he, he had this amazing statement. He said, the next form, the next form of the human species will see the whole first, see the whole first. So I, I agree with that. I, I think it's, um, I think many others that have thought about that uh, agree in this. So it's the sense that we uh, all want to. We all want to participate in the transformation of our world, and in the in the to relieve the unnecessary suffering, and to to encourage the the blossoming of beauty and love. All of us, we, we want this, and so Immanuel Kant's um, his like his the clue, the clue for moving forward from. Our, our present state as modern humans into this new state, the, the clue is to become aware of the whole in different ways. I mean, there, there's so many different ways of coming to, to the sense of wholeness. And the, the one that, that we're, we're celebrating today is, is that word cosmogenesis. Cosmogenesis the, and the meaning is, is very simple to say, is that uh, we are the generation that has learned the universe is a developing reality. Up until, up until, our, up until our time, we regarded the universe as a, as a place inside of which things changed. So this is, this is the massive shift from cosmos to cosmogenesis. Massive, massive shift. It is, it, you know, and the way, to, the way to take in what's going on is to think of um, Copernicus. Copernicus had this radical theory um, that we live on a round planet that is circling a star. I mean, when you think about the, the number of, of civilizations and in, in ancient you know, stories about the earth being a, um, a flat region with a bowl of stars above it. And, and that everyone took this as obvious that the earth was, was this fixed, fixed place at the very center of the universe, not, didn't move. Other things moved. Earth was set. And then some guy shows up and he's saying, no, no, no. He said, we're on a planet that's fl flying through space. I mean, just try to imagine how hard that was to take in 
And apparently, if you look at the internet, there are a number of people that haven't yet really accepted it, you know, still hanging on to that flat earth theory. Why not? That's what we worked for our ancestors. Let's stick with it. But I, I'm just, I'm not trying to make fun of them, but I'm, I'm just trying to come home to the, the challenge before us. And just like, um, just like Copernicus, you know, they had all these objections to what he was saying. They say, what do you mean the earth is spinning? If it were spinning, then the Atlantic Ocean would be washing over Europe, you know? That doesn't make any sense. And then, and besides, we watch the stars come up every night and they go across the sky, go across the sky every night. You see, so that we, that's what we have. We're, and we have to, we have to, we have to think about what it means to be a developing being inside a developing universe. So one, just to have one, um, one one way I, I, I would encourage you to think about gone, it is has gone down to 87. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. So one way to think about this is is to just to reflect on how we tend to think of of humans as as always sort of like us. Like we know more and we have we have lots of uh, technology and we've built cities, but, but we think of ourselves as being human, you know, from the start, but, but actually uh, that's not the case that we fought differently in the past. Our imaginations were different. So we, to really take in that we are, we are this flowing energy inside of a flowing energy that is, that's the big challenge before us. Now, when I say um, it's, it's, a, it's going to change things more than Copernicus, I just think of this, just think of this. Uh, John Locke is the principal political philosopher of the modern era. Adam Smith is the principal economist of the modern era. We have built institutions on their thinking and they knew nothing about what I'm talking about. They simply did not know that we were inside of a changing, developing reality. So it's, it's a formidable task we have before us. All of, our, all of our institutions are in this moment of transition. And, and we hardly know what we're doing. We're, it's chaotic, and that's, but that's the nature of change in, in the cosmogenesis. The chaos accompanies these transitions, but we, it's really important for us to take the, the long view because, because even though we're, we're incensed by, by the, by the massive stupidity of certain actions taking place, it, that, that will continue so long as we live in this idea of a, of a, of a fixed universe and a fixed human. So, Cosmogenesis is the, the, the story of the birth and development of the universe and of the role humanity is, has to live out as part of this. And that's what, what that role is. That's what we need to figure out. So now we, we move to um, the other the other term, this other, this other massive idea, uh, noosphere, noosphere. The word, first of all, let's start with the word. Um, it, it comes from the Greek word mind and sphere. And the word was invented exactly 100 years ago by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Uh, we're celebrating this with a conference in the, the San Francisco Bay Area in the middle of November. We haven't yet figured out who the speakers are and all that, but, but it's, it's, we're trying to find a way to wake up um, humanity to this radical idea of the noosphere. So what is the noosphere? To, to begin, 
uh, just picture the birth of the earth. It's so we have this this accretion of 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 atoms uh, that form the solar system. All of those atoms came from a supernova explosion. Some of them collapsed into the earth. So that as they collapsed, they uh, the heat uh, grew, the temperature grew. And so the early earth was molten, molten rock, really. And so that we refer to as the geosphere. And then as the as this uh, the, the mixing that was taking place in this boiling molten um, rock, uh, it would release gases. <laughs> so that we were building, the earth was building an atmosphere. And then I, the next transition was when the various minerals of the earth actually came together and invented life. And life spread around the planet the biosphere. Life began maybe 3.9 billion years ago. For 3 billion years, it remained unicellular. And then they had this amazing moment of giving birth to the animals and the plants. Say they spread around the earth and they, we call it the biosphere. And now we come to our moment. The emergence of the human species has led to a form of thinking that is different, is qualitatively different than the, the form of thinking that was present throughout the animal kingdom. And that the form of thinking uses symbols. And we could go into that, but I just just to fix it in your mind that it was a new and powerful form of thinking that led to a rapid expansion of the human all around the planet. And the thinking of these of these humans linked up and became a network that became in charge of the evolution of a planet. Even before we realized what was happening, we had created this, this sphere of thought that was made that then that sphere of thought was responsible for actions that were altering the planet on the on the on the level of millions of years. So we find ourselves right in the midst of this. It took a genius like Teilhard to actually notice it and give it a name. And, and so now we, we have the, the, the challenge and the thrill of bringing forth uh, a, more, a, more, uh, a more amazing noosphere. And I've, I've, I've described it now as a sphere of thought, as a network of thinking. Another way of, of speaking of it is it's a unified humanity a unified humanity. And, and just, I know that, that um, the idea of thinking of humanity as being unified is, is extremely difficult, uh, given the antagonisms we have around the, in our country and around the planet. But it is, if we, if we look back over the last 100,000 years, we find a sequence of unifications, just like in a, in a sentence, we hundred thousand years ago we lived in small bands of a couple dozen humans. And then fifteen thousand years ago, these bands actually began to understand each other well enough to form villages of several thousand. And then a few thousand years ago, the villages grew. And we had the ability to actually unite millions of humans in cities. This, this, nothing like this has taken place in the 70 million years 
of, of primate evolution. Nothing like this. It's ontologically new. And so we're, we're shuddering here at this moment of moving beyond the nation state era into this, this vibrant pulsing earth community with the unified homo sapiens. So those are the two great words of, um, of our time. Thank you, Brian. Um, that, was, that was just an amazing overview right there, Brian. That was just beautiful. We should, That's we should. pretty much all I have to say, Jennifer. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> if people have to go home now, they, they've got it all. <laughs> um, we'll come back shortly to the significance of these insights, but I, I wanted to, because this comes out of science, a lot of this, everything comes out of science with these uh, huge breakthroughs and understanding. And in your book, Cosmogenesis, you talk about um, science as a holy search, science as a holy search. And I can guess what you mean by that, but can you say more about what you mean about science as a holy search? Yes, yes, I can. Um, and, and, and this idea as well goes back to uh, Teilhard de Chardin. And his word was... Um, Science is is worship. Science is worship. I mean, I I should probably um, science can be worship. It can be a number of things. But but in Teilhard's view, which I love, the highest calling of science is an is a holy act. What is it? What, what does that mean? It, um, You know, when we think about when we think about um, the human the human species, there there are these fundamental uh, urges and desires and drives. They're just they're, they're who we are. We're we're our lives are are articulations of this of the yearning and longing and desires that we discover in in our existence. And one of the the one that relates to science is a fundamental desire to know the nature of reality. And, you know, we see this, we see this with uh, young children. I mean, they, they want to know what's going on. They ask the, the why question. It goes on forever, especially when they're four years old. You know, they, it's just, where am I? What am I doing? What, who, you know, where's mom? Where's dad? Who, what, all of these questions. So, they, the the other animals, in a certain sense, um, have have that that sense of curiosity, but they also have a they also have a deep wisdom that is carried by the DNA. They the other animals have worked out a, a wisdom that enables them to participate in their communities, their ecosystems in mutually enhancing ways. They, they've, they've done that, but we're so recent. We, we, we don't have an understanding of ourselves mapped out. We were in search of it. And that, so that search uh, is, is behind the whole enterprise of science. Um, Einstein, Einstein's view of science was the um, the recapitulation of the universe in conceptual form. I thought that's such a great. Just that's what science is yeah. about. It's discovery of the story of the universe in in mathematical symbols in the English language. That's what we're about. So the so. Really, the the notion of of science being a, a holy quest is is um, associated with the idea of the incarnation. So it's so that we the view of the, of many of us here is that there's something sacred about the very nature of the universe. It, just the universe being itself 
is a, um, a sacred event. And our, our participation in that, in a very fundamental way, is to discover what it is the universe is doing. The universe will continue to do what it's doing, but for whatever reason, it now requires uh, that process to be articulated in human consciousness. So that, that's what I, I would say. It's not, I would not, I don't think it's the only primordial dimension of humanity. I'm not saying that, but it is, it is one of them, this discovery of this, this search for what is, what is taking place, what is happening. So in your book, Brian, you know, you spend a lot of time, I mean, it's, it's about your per personal story. And a big part of the, I, it must be at least a third of the book, you know, you talk about your career in science and teaching science as a mathematical cosmologist, but you had to leave mainstream science in order to inquire into the significance of science. I, I just find that kind of an amazing story. You know, you had to leave the mainstream in order to really inquire into the significance of it. Um, what, what can you say about that? Well, that was, it was, um, it was an extremely difficult decision. It's just extremely difficult. Um, it, it took me years to, to finally accept it. And the way I understand it now is that I, because I, there's nothing I love more than mathematical physics and mathematical cosmology. And why would I step out of that? It, and one way to, one way to say it is that uh, the scientific um, endeavor has gone through phases. And uh, if we, if we take science in a, in a general um, more general sense. You go back to Aristotle, a brilliant biological scientist. So that was, uh, it, it was a great form of science. And then we had, when we got into the modern period, it became um, more mathematical. So we had a mathematical or even a mechanical form of science. And the, and, and we're changing again we're changing again, going back to Penny's point, we're, we're developing a science that begins with the whole. So the holistic science. And I, looking back on my life, I, I would say that on some level, I realized that I would not be able to move forward in, in my quest to understand the universe. If I remained inside the context of mathematical science right there's something sometimes you need to leave the context to get a bigger view of it and the the, the name of I, I mentioned holistic science sometimes it's called complexity science uh, it, it's not as if i know what what is going to take place but i just know the transition is happening but my favorite phrase for it is from Thomas Berry. And, and that is this. He says, we are entering the wisdom phase of modern science. I love that. Yeah, that's beautiful. Because during, my, during, <clears throat> during, during the modern period, I get the mathematical equations. That was everything, right? But now we're asking, oh, how, how does this knowledge fit into the whole earth community, even into the whole universe. Absolutely. So in this view, you know, of the whole, and we move to a radically different understanding of causation and agency, because we're looking at the whole now. How does, how does the noosphere fit into that picture of moving from the individual to the whole? Oh, that's, that is a great question. Yeah. Um, 
I wish I had thought of that while I was answering the last one. But this is because this is so fundamental. Uh, so the, the, the image of causation throughout, throughout the modern period was that of, of, of atoms um, colliding. So the, it's called the billiard ball explanation. And so we wanted so much to, to understand something by reducing it down to the movement of, of particles and atoms. And, and so <clears throat> if I, let me give you an example. If I'm, if I'm <laughs> studying um, something like a billiard ball and I, I see it moving by me, all right? And I'm gonna, I want to understand wh why is that billiard ball moving by me that fast? Well, I know, as, you know, this is the point of view of, of the form of causation in modern science. I know that something in the past happened. Something bounced into it or something. It was something in the past that happened that caused this billiard ball to move forward like that. But now with the noosphere, with the idea of the noosphere, we have a different understanding of causation. And that is, the future is involved in the activities of the present. Now, if you happen to be a scientist, um, I know you're probably choking right now. And if you have friends that are scientists, don't even tell them what I just said. Because this idea of the future as having power is outside of mathematical cosmology. It goes outside of, of Darwinian biology. It's a different, new, powerful idea. And, it, and it, it, Teilhard wasn't the only person to think this way, but he's the one we're celebrating. Um, and, it, and it, of course, there's a difference between the past and the future, for sure. I'm not saying they're identical. But in your, in your own experience, in your own experience, if you, if you reflect on your lives and just ask, well, what was the cause of that action? You, you'll find, or you know instantly, that it, many times it's an image of what you want to have happen. That, that, or maybe you come across something that strikes, that it gives you an idea. It's an image of, of what could be the future that is the cause of the action in the moment. Now, Teilhard is generalizing that. He is saying that the, the universe yearns to move forward in different ways. It, 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 the whole is real. Immanuel Kant, Immanuel Kant, that's what he's saying. The whole is real. And so... I am, I am interpreting the, the yearning I feel inside my experience as coming at least in part from the future. So when I say that, when I say that the, the universe is yearning for a unified humanity, that would be an example of, of my interpretation of my own experience in terms of a cause arising from the future. And I, 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 I just, I just think that is, it's just a fantastic new way of thinking, you know, and I, I and I especially think of, of young people. I mean, the, the youth of our time, they're just not all, but so many of them are committing suicide and the, and the, and the violence. I mean, it's, they're not, I'm not trying to blame it just on the youth. I'm trying to say, for something real and if, if they could begin to to understand that deep in their experience is the universe drawing them into their fundamental role a role that is unique to them that yes. that's that's the thing that that idea that the universe in its future form is calling to us and that the universe is actually has has unique and particular roles for every entity it's an it's that is that idea takes us out of modern science into the wisdom of science yeah beautiful 
Um, so looking at your own personal life, Brian, you know, when you met Matthew Fox and you met Thomas Berry, I mean, that meeting utterly altered your life, you know, utterly altered your life. And just, you know, following up on the idea of what you were just talking about, you know, that the future, you know, was calling forth something <laughs> to happen in your life. And so, yeah. I mean, when, when I look at you meeting, you know, Matthew Fox and, and Thomas Berry, I know this sounds kind of grandiose, but I really do think of it this way, that that was, that was a cosmic event. That was a cosmic event, you meeting Matthew Fox and meeting Thomas Berry. And, and it's making a difference, you know, it's making a difference. So just putting those ideas together, what you were just talking about with the future calling forth something to happen in the present, and then looking at your own life and its impact beyond your life. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. I I should have muted that. I'm so sorry. I just didn't get to <laughs> the mute button fast. We enough. can we can we can handle it, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Matthew Fox and Thomas Berry, these two, you know, giants of world history, really. And and you know, they they for me it was a cosmic event meeting them. It was I that's one of my favorite, actually, one of my favorite um, short chapters. Um, they met, and I was there, and they were they they could only talk about Hildegard of Bingen. It was just it was just too much. It was so beautiful. It, in the moment, you know, in the moment, I didn't understand everything that was going on, but I knew something really important was going on. I yeah. just felt it, right? It was just. But I just to say a few things about uh, what they mean to me. I mean. Matthew Fox, um, one of his fundamental ideas is that, that uh, Christianity has been taken over by a, a fall redemption uh, spirituality, so that it, 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 it took creation, it took the universe, and, and built um, a fundamental distrust in our minds concerning the universe. So, uh, it, if, if you have a very intensely fall redemption orientation to, to hear someone like myself speak of the universe in the future calling us forward is, is nonsense because there isn't that you can't trust something that's in a fallen state. And, you know, so it was, it was Matt, Matt Fox was a, for me, a great liberator of, 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 of myself and many others in in these in these the sense of uh, all of the all of the the scholars and the poets and, the, and the, the thinkers that he brought together all affirming the idea affirming one idea we can trust the universe yeah it's trustworthy we can trust the universe so that that was just it was a great liberation and then thomas berry um he uh, he really not just in my opinion here but he i think he was the first person to understand that this story of the universe uh, was going to change everything i mean he, even though he learned a lot from Teilhard, Teilhard doesn't emphasize the story the way thomas does Thomas thought of through from various cultures, and he, he always was thinking in terms of the whole. And so the the, the story of our of our development um, has this gigantic role to play in this this major transition we're going through. Yeah, so they were um, <laughs> for me and for so many others in a cosmic event. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Certainly was for me. <laughs> and I'm sure so many people <laughs> in this room right here would would say the same. Yeah. 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 Just ripple effects uh throughout our lives and throughout communities. Yeah. Um, 
so speaking of the future, can we, you know, vision ahead, let's say 2000 years to the year 4,023. Imagine that everybody, you know, 4,023. Brian, what can you imagine planet earth to be, you know, and I, of course there are many different scenarios, but um, what's, what's that future that's, that's helping to shape the present from that far ahead? How can we think about that? I um, I I think it's really important to reflect on the future, and I at the same time, I I think we need to remember that uh, the future is going to surprise us. It's it's going to be something uh, so so totally different from what we expect. And so, I I mean, this a playful way. Of, um, of of least expressing how I think about it is is to just imagine if you go back um, in life five hundred million years and you um, and you, you're you're in touch with some of these unicellular organisms. So I mean, here's the here's the here's what science has learned. Little these little organisms, each one smaller than the sharp end of a pin. They, they got together, they formed, they deepened their relationships and over in veils. Now that, that uh, you know, that is, it's almost preposterous. They had, they had, I mean, and just, just think of how complex the whale is, the, the brain of the whale. The experience, the you know the 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 psychic nature of the whale, all of that, all of that came from tiny tiny cells coming together and forming relationships. Eyesight, right? They invented eyesight. They invented the heart. They so nothing came from the outside is the main point I'm trying to emphasize. Nothing came from the outside. And there, there, this didn't involve calculations and thinking. It was deeper than that. And it, the, I'm, I'm, I've already said the phrase, but just to say it again, is that all that happened was that they deepened their relationships. So this, this idea of of uh, this is what this is this is one of the great gifts. This is, I mean, I regard this as something as important as the sacred scriptures of of different cultures. That the ultimate creativity of the universe is evoked through relationship. So, the in terms of what the future will be like, it. Uh, all I can really say, I've already, I've already given you my main view, is that we will, it will be a unified humanity within the Earth community, and exactly what that means. Well, that I think we'll, we'll have to discover it. But the, the, what I want to say about the future is that it will come forth primarily by humans deepening their bond and relationship with one another. We see, we, we don't know. What's, what will come up out of our relationships? We, we can't know if we, if we can remember how the, we can stay in that state of astonishment in our deeper relationships. Just, and, and to realize that we, we don't really know this other person completely, We're, it, because this other person is coming forth and the and the stunning fact is this other person is coming forth in a unique way because of us. Yeah. They'll be coming forth in a different way with others. So there's just the it's like logical thrill of finding ourselves right there at the core, the core fire of the universe's unfolding. 
So isn't that kinship? So coming back to the idea. Yes, yes. <laughs> there's kinship. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Global, kinship. Global kinship. And the noosphere, see, comes in here in a big way because we we can now form this kinship relationship with with humans all over the planet. Not a whole bunch at once, but some. We can be in communication with them. We can be we can be writing emails to someone in Iran, and, and you know, even if you've never been there, you can establish this this relationship. And it, I mean, it's just just imagine um, ninety thousand years ago, the human being was identical to us, same body size, same brain. Ninety thousand years ago, they go through their entire lifetime. And, and see 30 people. I mean, and I'm sure it was a good 30 people. I'm sure they had a great time. You know what I mean? But the, the kind of diversity that's possible, it enables a creativity that simply couldn't happen in the past. That's the noosphere in action. So we've, we've seen in the, you know, the cosmic story, the way crises come up and then somehow the universe addresses it and breaks through. And we are coming to these insights now, right when we have these crises we're facing, yeah. climate change um, and you know pollution, so many crises across the planet. So, I mean, this seems, <laughs> this seems cosmic itself, right, to have Absolutely. It's yeah. happening at the time when we are gaining these insights. What can you say about that? Just that um, that in the in the history of life, um, but to to say it in a rhetorical fashion, it let me just say it this way that that every ecosystem is is filled with mortal enemies. You know the 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 hawk and the mouse. I mean, the the mouse has got to get away from that hawk, or it's going to be eaten. And and the hawk is you know intensely upset by the speed of the mouse. But it's it's this this tension, this creative tension, that gives rise to the excellence of the hawk and the excellence of the mouse. We, you know, we would we, humans. We humans you know, we would do things differently. I mean, I, when we've talked about myself, if I were God, I would make, I would make mice um, and, and, and the hawk learn to get along without even eating each other. I don't know. I'd get food somewhere else. I'd have the hawk learn how to get food from the star. You know what I mean? I just, I don't like the thought that there's this kind of tension and so forth, but this is the way the universe creates that we, we, we have to embrace it because it's the fundamental reality. So just like you say right now, the um, the 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 we have these cri this crisis we're in multiple crises, and responses are coming forth. We're coming up with new ideas just because of that. You know the we can go on and on about this, but I what I'm I'm saying simply is that there there has to be a, there can be a way of embracing those that you most oppose, embracing them as, as a larger dimension of yourself. Because in your struggle to convince them otherwise, you are developing your eyes, the ideas, you're sharpening your thinking, so that it's in that contest, in that struggle, that we, we find a deeper wisdom. So it, it right now we, we it, you know the the tragedy is the is right now is that we we're so polarized and we're we're so convinced the other side is is utterly you know horrible we we need we need to find a way to embrace even the difficulties of the of our time as the way in which the universe is moving forward. Yeah, that's that's such a hard one, you know. It's a hard one for us, I think, but absolutely imperative. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so Brian, one of the great gifts that you have given us is 
that you know when we hear you speak and we read your books you we we get this visceral sense of the insights that you're talking about like i mean i'm just speaking for myself when i read your books it's like i feel it in my body you know i i i feel it and uh, one of the things that I keep hearing in the network, the Deep Time Network is, and oh, Margie is here. Margie is here, is uh, Margie Abbott from Australia. We're teaching, she's teaching a course right now on creating ecozoic practices. So what kind of practices, how, how can we, you know, take these insights and uh, keep reminding ourselves about them? There's, it's easy to forget. You know, it's easy to forget. We need to keep reminding ourselves and bringing it back into our lives very intentionally. And I'm just wondering about how you do that in your life. I, well, there, you know, I, there are a number of, of practices that I use. I, I don't, I'm not a, a very disciplined person in terms of spiritual practice. So I, I in a haphazard way, um, what what I what I look for in my daily life is the um, the cosmological dimension of an ordinary moment. The cosmological dimension they just they surface they surface, and um, maybe I'll just use one of the examples I put in. Um, in cosmogenesis, uh, my my whole my whole my whole aim really in in writing cosmogenesis was to was to help people uh, see the cosmos at working in their ordinary lives, and not and not not just sort of theoretically understand it, but like you say, Jennifer, to to feel it. It's like suddenly you just I mean the. I, I I really hope that that the cosmogenesis generates a number of other books or art projects because it feels so different for everyone and 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 when we can compare notes you know and it it makes it makes us realize that that we've had these experiences many many times but we haven't been able to articulate them because they haven't been widely supported by our culture so uh the one maybe just just to choose one like cosmogenesis consists of 24 such moments right and in a sense jennifer each of them becomes a, a spiritual practice for me so just to just to name one i was um i was in a lot of pain physical pain uh, i was uh, my heart was not doing well and i was and i was staring at um i i it was after church and I was looking at my arm and I was, I don't know why, honestly, I just suddenly noticed, um, I just looked at my, my arm and I, and I, and I felt the sun, I felt the sun's rays warming my skin, just came out of church. And then suddenly the sunlight is on my skin. And I just sat there and I thought, I thought, I thought in all my life, in all my life, I have never once thought about how my body has the power of changing photons into feelings of warmth. I mean, I just, you know, I just sort of took it for granted or something, but, but you know, photons are these, these, these particles flying through the air. They land on my skin and I feel my consciousness, my feel, I feel warm. I feel warm. Right. And so I was amazed by that. And, and then, and then I, I was sort of remembering that the, so the, the, com, the complexity of the skin and was composed of atoms that came from a star that exploded. So there I'm staring at my, I'm staring at my arm. I'm amazed at this power. The, the photons from one star are transforming into warmth that has been enabled by the atoms that came from another star. So I had like this, the other star was billions of years old, right? 
And so I, I had this feeling, a simple, simple feeling of being inside this cosmic event. It was happening. And I was simply witnessing it. I was, I was this other star that had blown up. I was this other star that was warming me. I was just the whole process reflecting on itself. Mm. You know, I mean, there's just, in, in, the, in the course of any one day, there are hundreds and hundreds of some po such possible moments. And in my own intuition, I've, I've talked about how, I've talked about how the, uh, the future is a unified humanity. But another way, another way of talking about it is that the future will be determined by a humans uh, realizing they are the universe reflecting upon itself. Yeah. To feel it, just like you were saying, Jennifer, to feel it, yeah. the experience. Yeah. And, and so it doesn't have to be a great big ritual. It can be as much as just... Staring you know, at your arm, yeah. Staring at your arm. Yeah. Another one I have in the, the cosmic, I won't go into it, but it's, it's dropping a pencil. I do that all the time. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. And I, I explain it. You know, I, it take a while to, to explain it. Can you do it? <laughs> you want to do it quickly? Or no? <laughs> it, we know it's kind of, it's, it, I think part of the um, process is to uh, deconstruct some of the axioms of scientific materialism. So mm -hmm. you have to kind of go through a process and then suddenly you drop a pencil and it, 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 it means something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, thank you so much, Brian. This is such an amazing- My pleasure. Free to sit and We're with. gonna talk, we're gonna have some Q and A, right? Yeah, we sure are. And um, I think Gail or Penny are going to take over and and handle the Q and A. Is that right, Penny or Gail? Actually, Bob is 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 our master at that. Oh, He's, uh, okay. So Penny, Penny and I may chime in. You never know. Okay. Uh, so Jennifer, uh, thanks. Thanks so much for the conversation. It's great. Thank you. Always. Thank you, Brian, so much. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Always. You're welcome. Holding onto your voice for that much time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Bob, you, you can take me off the spotlight if you want. Just in the process of doing that. Thank you much. So I thought I saw a hand, but I guess it went back down. If you have a question for Brian. There's uh, a hand. There's a hand. There's a hand. And um, so please unmute yourself and, uh, and uh, go ahead. Hi. Hi, um, Sina. Hi, Brian. I am actually asking a question on behalf of my partner, Tom Acklin, because I find it so fascinating. He had to leave. And his question was, might the other life forms here um, also have something akin to a noosphere inside their own context of wisdom? We <laughs> humans can only know our own defaults and biases because we only have this brain and it, and its vast and limited senses. So I'm especially interested in bacterial life. And so answering, especially inside the wisdom of monocellular critters, do you think other species also have this kinship and thrill at their own particular forms of intercommunication? I, I do, absolutely. Yes, and, and each, each species, has another form of, of, of responding to uh, the noospheric um, probings. Yeah, definitely. It's the whole, the whole earth community in different ways. We have, we have theirs. <laughs> That's a very great question. Uh, and I'll just quickly say that I'm savoring your book and it's felt a bit like when I was in the 80s and I was watching the never ending story. I was a child and your book has felt like that, that I'm now a participator in this whole thing. And I have so many aha moments. So thank you. Oh, God. Thank you. I really appreciate that, Hasina. Thank you. I'm glad. The never, enders, never ending story. That's a good phrase for the universe. <laughs> 
All right, Patty, go ahead and unmute yourself. And... Thank you, uh, Bob, and thank you, Brian and um, Jennifer. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, reflecting on uh, things that I'm reading in groups that I belong to, e ecological survival groups. Okay, and yeah. so the question is: scientists are warning us about the dangers of overshoot. The fact that there are more humans on the planet than Earth's biosystems can support. Um, the collapse of the human population from 8 billion to a more sustainable 2 billion could be viewed as a ca catastrophe of pain and suffering. And a number of scientists have forecasted that this is going to happen, whether we like it or not. It could be even worse. And are we to just accept this collapse as part of the universe adjusting to limit the human species. Um, I mean, you know, when, when we look at from now to the year 4,000, it's fine, you know, whatever happens, happens, it's more remote. But I'm thinking of my grandnieces and grandnephews who might actually have to live through this collapse. And um, I don't, I don't see, I don't see the, um, the success of relationships happening in time okay yeah thanks patty um i mean i i we probably don't differ i well i i do differ on on scientists that the state with 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 such confidence they know the future they don't it's the system is far too we we can't we can't predict the weather beyond a day or two or three now. So, but but we have we have we have altered um, in many ways the fundamental systems of our planet. There, I I don't see any way forward that is free from suffering. I think that's simply going to be part of the transition. It, it, but I, I I guess one thing. Uh, Patty, that that gives me hope, and that is, you know, I, no one, no one that is sane wakes up in the morning and thinks, hey, I wonder if I, I wonder if I can go out there and kill a few species. Now, but humanity as a collective, we are killing, you know, thousands of species a year. It's, you know, it's horrendous. But the the point is, uh, those structures. The structures that are involved in this are based on a view of the world that we now know is faulty. And, and if, if, if given a little bit of time, I, I, I feel like I, I'm not trying to brag here at all, but I feel like I, can, I could talk almost anyone into um, viewing the universe as a fascinating place and begin to question begin to question some of the activities that are ruining the beauty of the world. I think any of us, all of us here could do that. And we have this amazing new noospheric power, this global communication. It is possible that, that if, we, if we find the right way of articulating what we now know, there will be a massive shift taking place around the planet. The Berlin Wall, remember that? It was going to be up forever. And suddenly one day it just was gone. And so I, I'm not saying that this will happen for sure. I'm not. But it is a possibility. And the, the, the reality of the noosphere, which I, I tried to go into, the reality of the noosphere is, is the greatest uh, story of hope we have. It is... The, the, the power we've taken over the planet and we, if, if we can uh, wake up to this we can change the way we're altering it i, I think it's hg wells who said we are in we are in a battle between education and catastrophe and so that's 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 where i'm at i'm i'm committed to educating the human species and I know, I know many of you are, I think together we're, we're yeah. going to make a difference. But thanks, Patty. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. 
Uh, Viola, go ahead and um, unmute you. There you go. Hi, Brian. I am so Hi, glad. Viola. I am so glad to talk to you today. I have so many questions, but I'm going to limit it to a couple of things. You know, um, Thomas Berry's time developmental uh, consciousness fascinates me. And it's the idea of time. It's like, it seems like we introduced the vertical aspect. I mean, we've been linear, right? Linear yeah. causality and all that stuff. But then time comes in and we got that, that, that dynamic way. It, it's not just linear, but it's a movement, a, a process sort of. And so you uh, have been developing the third story. And see, that, that's been my life work. It's like, how do we combine science and religion and make them just work together because they can and because they do in the long run when you look at the mystics, they all end up in the same place. <laughs> and so, so I was also fascinated by that third story. Could you talk a little bit more about that and just kind of tell us where you are with that project and where it's going? Yeah, I can. Um, let me just say that the, um, you know, going back to the to Matt Fox's contribution of, of, um, of emphasizing the 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 mystics and the saints in the the Christian tradition, the Jewish tradition that saw creation as a blessing and as holy and sacred, uh, so that Thomas Berry. Um, was saying something similar, but it's 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 interesting the, the way he said it. He said, the universe is the primary revelation. The universe is the primary revelation. So Thomas Berry, you know, he, he loved scriptures. That's another form of revelation. He knew he knew about contemplation and meditation. He was behind that entirely, you know. But but he said, "We we have forgotten in the West. We have forgotten that that the cosmos itself, that creation itself, is the primary revelation. So, how does that connect then? If we look at the universe and ask, uh, well, what does it reveal? Right? If it's a revelation, what does it reveal? And one uh, Thomas thought that the the most spiritual event in um, history." is the supernova explosion you know now he, he thomas was a person who you know loved um, all religions i mean so buddha and christ and muhammad and just he loved all the religions but he, he was saying that the most significant spiritual event is the supernova explosion so what what does that say it says this that you have this you have a star the universe brings forth this star it, it, it exists for billions of years, and then in its, in its core, it's constructing the elements, and then it comes to the end, and it explodes, it dies, and releases its creations so that the universe can continue. Well, that, the phrase that, from religion that describes that is the Paschal mystery, and we're right in the midst of it. Tomorrow's Good Friday. It, it's it's the supernova explosion is is the Paschal mystery when you bring together the sciences and the religions. Thank you, Brian. You're welcome. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Viola. Uh, Catherine. So Brian, it's been delightful. I, I love listening to you. I have for a long time. But Thank I have you, a question Kevin. because I'm yeah. I'm unsettled by the noosphere. It feels to me, and as you explain it, that it's still a human-centric way of looking at the world. And I feel that the call of the universe is really to bring us all together that is all life not just human life which in my view would seem to to shift that human centric to a life centric perspective am i not understanding what you mean no it's an excellent question and i i think um there are there are forms of articulations of the noosphere 
that are entirely human centered um, with little regard for for the rest of life and those uh, you know those are not the ones I'm interested in I we we have to we have to um we have to understand a couple of things one is that that a a mutilated anthropocentrism is what has led to so much of the destruction of our earth i say it's mutilated because it's an anthropocentrism that that regards humans as the ultimate and final value of the earth and everything else is beneath us and so and that that form of of view regards the earth as a like a gravel pit it's just stuff that's there for our resources I, the, the horrible word natural resources horrible it's a reflection of the of the kind of anthropocentrism that you're criticizing. Now, instead of that, I'm I'm attempting to, and others, I'm attempting to develop uh, what what Viola talked about as the, the time developmental consciousness, time developmental consciousness, and is the realization that uh, we humans are nothing outside of our relationships. And our relationships aren't constrained to the present moment. Our relationships go back through time. Right. So we, we have to understand that the, um, the human brain comes from the creativity of fish. They invented the first, the brains that led to the mammalian brain, to led to the primate brain. So. We are nothing if we take away our relationships uh, to fish or to anything in the universe. We're related to anything. So it of the noosphere and the global connections that are possible within the human group, it is not to say that the human group is the ultimate, not at all. It is to say that we have a particular role that will enable that will enable earth to enter into its next form of, of of beauty of blossoming which we don't we we can't fully know that but we we're here in that sense uh more as servants than as as lord lords and masters so um i, I my view is not the the mutilated anthropocentrism of a single hierarchy my, my view is we live in the midst of heterarchies somebody made up that word i love it heterarchies and oh, yeah. ev every species is at the top of some hierarchy and ours ours happens to be symbolic language we, we're great at it but we can't create oxygen the way phytoplankton can and so forth yeah yeah, yeah um that's helpful uh the 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 picture i carry is that our bodies are a biome we're filled with thousands of individuals that are yeah. all functioning in their own way um and i speculate that our intelligence is is our intelligence yes not my nice. intelligence yes exactly. and so and i'm kind trying to relate that to your idea of the noosphere because i want to make the noosphere sort of a, a larger view of that but what i'm hearing i just keep hearing this lateral so please help me feel how to integrate those two no well well Catherine, you got to help me i mean that we're, we're really in the midst of this you, you should have the conference in november I mean, we're 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 as we go. We're trying to discover the deeper dimensions of the noosphere, and what you're saying is is absolutely right. You know, I'm doing the best I can. I'm sure you are too. But together, we're going to come up with some new stuff. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. All right, I think we have. Um... Time for one more question uh, from MJ, please. Hi, Brian. 
MJ. It's good to see you. It's so good, good to, to see you. you. <laughs> and I mostly just want to thank you for your book. It's so wonderful on so many levels. I mean, the ideas are wonderful and finding out more about your life and what led you mm -hmm. to your life is wonderful. And then the, you know, I always think about the development of young people and what they yeah. have to face now and the example you give of, of the struggle it took to follow the right path when it, you had to drop out of what their your whole culture was saying was a good job yeah. and yeah. and go in an utterly unknown direction that's hard to do yeah and yeah. i just think um i'm just so grateful that you gave that you put your own life out there to give people that um example of how hard it can be yeah yeah. Uh, to really go in the right direction. And then I don't really have a question, just that the last couple of questions and your answers have, have brought me to a place of really wondering how deeply our idea of uh, the self and our perception of what it means to be human and our perception of psychology is going to change. Because I was thinking... You know, I'm also, I'm so grateful that you made yourself so vulnerable in this book. And that from a, from the perspective of current psychology, that's where we have sort of encapsulated individual egos. That is vulnerable, but it might become more common that, you know, we all share more equally or openly um, if we start to see ourselves as a flow of relationships, not yeah. one yeah. person. Yeah. So yeah. Speculations add gratitude. That's all. <laughs> oh, that's great, MJ. That's great. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And also coming from someone who has the courage to just get rid of all of her, her books and stray off into a new direction in, in, in the world of Native America. It really means a lot to me, MJ. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, MJ. I, um, I saw Gail had her hand up a second ago, and I think I should uh, uh, bring uh, the boss into the... Uh, <laughs> I didn't know I was the boss. Uh, <laughs> Well, but it's a hierarchy. I don't know. I thought, I thought the three of us were working like a team. No, absolutely. But I just uh, um, thought you needed a chance here. Thank you. Well, I, my, my chance is just to say thank you, Brian. And I think, MJ, that was the right question to end on. Um, thank you for your time and for plowing through your, your cold, your body uh, what uh, today and to spend this time with us. And if you have questions or you have anything... Um, uh, you have a month to write them down and ask the next time because Brian is coming back on May 11th to talk about the noosphere consciousness. And um, I'm, I'm excited about that one as I was today. And here is his book. It's a wonderful book. <laughs> and uh, just, just um, you might want to read that um, in the next month. If, uh, but uh, so uh, thank you all for coming and uh, being open and uh, being part of this this great adventure we're having together in the noosphere, the, 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 this adventure of imagining through our experience what a new life could be, different from what we're told from all different corners, just what we know in our hearts and what is brought to us by the sun on our arms or uh, however. It came to me like a, um, I opened the window and whoosh, this goodness, this positivity came in and I, uh, I, I knew I recognized it. I, and when you talked about the noosphere, I knew what you were talking about because I had that feeling. Oh, it was right. yes. And um, yeah. So that's uh, great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, oh, no, thank you. So um we'll um see each other again, I hope. And unless Penny, you have anything else to say? Um, I just want to share a quote that Brian uh, said in passing. 
poet of science and troubadour of the universe. Uh, it's we ignite the beauty in ourselves to ignite the beauty in others that has carried me so far and given me more courage than I ever thought I'd have. <laughs> and I think that's what you you give us a, a sense of belonging to something that is so magnificent. And we all have such gratitude. Thank you. Ben. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> And I we look forward it. to next month. What yes. a treat. <laughs> what a treat. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. And thank, thank you, you so Jennifer, much. for your for your great questions. <laughs> thank you. And uh, we appreciate your being here so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gail. It was a great pleasure. Great to be with you all. Yeah. What a day. All right. Blessings. Blessings. Thanks, Blessings. Hope Blessings. to see you next month. You uh, love Blessings. <laughs> I guess I'm going to